Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we're joined by P. Sainath, the founding editor of the People's Archive of Rural India, and we're going to be talking about the farmers' protests, which began on November 26th, as we know. They have intensified over the weeks. The government has uh, engaged in talks, what it calls talks at least, but which have actually been more of a holding action, for lack of a better word. Sainath, thank you so much for joining us. I first wanted to go into an issue which came out of the latest round of uh, discussions where the government said it, it gave a proposal to the farmers which the organizations rejected because they want the repeal of the laws. But one of the key elements or the most important element was that they said they would give a written assurance that the current MSP system would continue. And now there's been a lot of debate about how MSP is at the heart of this. So what really is the catch when the government is saying that this current MSP system will continue? Well, first of all, I think there's been very little discussion. There's been a lot of posturing yeah, by a government that was completely caught off guard. It passed the, there was a reason why it passed these laws and do not forget the labor codes at the height of the pandemic. This is something the media refused to look at. Mr. Modi had a very huge majority in parliament before the pandemic he is likely to keep it two years after the pandemic is under control. Why did a government in the midst of a pandemic with, you know, second or third worst in the world with daily cases has a thousand things demanding its attention, but it passed these laws. There was a reason for that. Its calculation was that the farm, that the farming community and the working class are at this moment helpless, cannot hit back, cannot organize. They are cowed down by COVID, pulverized by the pandemic. These guys can't hit back at us. That was a terrible miscalculation. Logically, it was a very, very valid assumption to make, but it misfired in that the farmers of Punjab, Haryana, and nearby states did not accept that assumption. And Flouted. The second thing is that um, I love this idea of consultation after the fact. Hmm. The consult, even the government in its supposed discussion, is admitting that these that these amendments, these new laws, were enacted enacted for trade and commerce, and any consultation that took place took place with the biggest of big businesses in this country. It, it did that. There was no consultation of farmers. The RSS, Kisan Front says they had no idea. They were never consulted, that they had nothing to do with these laws, right? So it's an absolute fabrication that there was any consultation when their own party units, etc., are saying so. In fact, I understand that the BJP printed some 10 lakh patraks, little leaflets for distribution in Chandigarh, Punjab and gave them to its uh, local unit. I do, I think very, I think precious little distribution of that has taken place. And the reason why the activists are going, dragging their feet on uh, distributing that is so obvious. I mean, you know, but even that's not important. Now this guaranteed MSP, Guaranteed MSPA means nothing in itself if you do not have guaranteed state procurement. We can describe and we can uh, declare in writing or in words or in cinema a, a sky high MSP, but then you don't gather it. You don't procure. So it means nothing. The, is there an, do I have an example of what I'm talking about? Many states have been doing this for years. Maharashtra, under the UPA, under the Congress government of Vilas Foundation, did this repeatedly when the suicides were at their worst in uh, Vidarbha and Maratha. What it did, it would declare um, high MSP per, per quintal per bail or per quintal uh, procurement very high MSP, it would declare. Then it would do three things. One, 
it would open half the number of MSP centers, minimum support, I mean, half the number of procurement centers required. So suppose uh, 10X was the number of procurement centers required for that region, it would open four, maybe five. The second thing it would do was to open the procurement centers 15, 20 days late. That would cr create huge uh, pileups outside the markets at, at Ghatanji, at Karanja. You could see kilometer long queues of farmers with their bullock carts, cotton piled up to the skies. And that, was, that would obviously first, when you start when you open half the number of centers, then there is incredible pressure on that farmer who's got to settle his or her bills, pay for the kids' school fees, and they will sell at whatever price they can get. Uh, that is one. The second thing is by reducing the number, you're doubling the pressure because that person's creditors are not going to wait for him to have an expedition to Gatanji for 10 days then they want their money and he's got to pay or she has got to pay huge bills that have piled up. Third tactic, close those centers 10 to 15 days early so that the late arrivals at the market are also forced towards private trade. So this is, this is what the, that game is about. MSP is meaningless if there is no guarantee procurement rule. Second, the second part of this offer, noble offer of the government of India is, you've made it before. Hmm? You made it in your manifesto in 2014, and you did not say till now, the second thing is that you have to define what is your understanding of cost of production on which the MSP is based. In 2014, Mr. Modi declared that within 12 months of coming to power, or some leaders even said within one month, we will implement the Swaminathan Commission's recommendation on MSP, cost of production, COP2 plus 50%. As you know, there are other methods of calculation. Uh, the ones that say Niti Aayog and private trade are very, um, happy with when the big corporations would be very happy with, which is uh, A2 is one way of calculating um, cost of production, which is simply the paid out costs of inputs, fertilizer, your uh, seeds and stuff. A2 plus FL is the second, which is input costs plus imputed cost of family labor. The Swaminathan Commission was very categorical in saying comprehensive cost of production plus 50%. Now, the government somewhere on some of these went in for A2 plus FL. It went in for that and uh, started claiming that it had implemented the Swaminathan Commission. Now, by the way, between A2 plus FL and uh, COP2, cost of product, uh, comprehensive cost of production plus 50%, A2FL plus 50%, and the, and the latter, the difference can be between 400 and 500 rupees per quinter. It can be that high. So suppose you're selling 20 quintals, what are you losing? Hmm. 20 into 20 into 400, can the farmer afford, can anyone afford that? So that was yet another game they played with the MSP. The third is that if you just go up right now to the Ministry of Consumer Affairs, you'll find a report there. Report of the Consumer Affairs Group 2011. And if you Google up the newspapers, you will see photographs of the great ceremony at which that report was presented to Dr. Manmohan Singh. The report on consumer affairs was anchored by a group of chief ministers. And it said, point three B, it said, no transaction between farmer and trader 
should be permitted below MSP. It said it in writing. Okay, no, no. Uh, and uh, the chairman of that group of chief ministers was one Mr. Narendra Modi of Gujarat. Hmm. So he he is an old hand at giving assurance. So how much these assurances are worth? You can see from the fact of how they behave with their manifesto, how they have behaved with the Swaminathan Commission report, how they have behaved with his own consumer affairs group report, which says no transaction. Given all these, what, you know, how does it mean anything? And the other thing is this, for big corporations trade, private trade, they are giving written parliament enacted laws. For the farmers, they're giving written assurances. And even that hasn't happened so far and we haven't seen what they look like. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And this context, I just wanted to ask you about another key narrative that the government has been pushing from day one. Not only the government, but you yourself have talked about how journalists, for instance, have called this the 91 moment mm -hmm. uh, for labor laws and agriculture as well. And this is the question of choice. The idea that somehow farmers are going to have this bonanza of choices once these laws are passed and it's all about the state stopping them from accessing, you know, all these uh, beautiful choices. So actually, after these laws are passed and once these laws are in operation, of course, how, what exactly is the kind of choice that they're going to be confronted with? In an irreversible, in an uh, irrefutable logic, the entire philosophy of the neoliberals of uh, pro-capitalist thinking is that markets offer you a choice. Now, uh, I think that if the 1.2 billion human beings the United Nations classifies as very hungry, if the 1.2 billion very hungry people in the world had a choice, I suspect they would choose to eat. The fact that they're unable to do so tells you that there is that the choice before them is a complete fake, a complete fraud. They, they do have another choice. They can starve, which is what they do. Yeah, this is the choice. The choice of the consumerist world is like you walk into a department, you walk into a mall or a or a supermarket or whatever, and you have a choice of which detergent you want to buy. There are 11 on the, 11 on the shelf before you, and nine of them are manufactured by Procter & Gamble. So you have a choice. You can buy the one with pink bubbles or the one with blue bubbles. That is your choice. The third, the third aspect of it is that you present something and say, choice and that you know look the government is so willing to discuss this it's like i pass a law sentencing you to death i pass the death sentence and then say you know i'm very reasonable and i'm willing to discuss with you amendments and we can see whether and we, you can state a preference and make a choice and whether the death will be by hanging or by boiling you in oil. Hmm. So, I mean, these are the philosophical aspects of, you know, what the basis of that choice is, what is right. meaningless. So that's one. Second, the, uh, the entire media have been going on about this, that the choice is even, even very well-meaning people write to me saying, but isn't it correct that we break this chokehold of the APMC. You know, when you are blinded or when you are blinded by propaganda or uh, drowning or because you are unable to get the blinkers of your eyes, you believe that you when you start with a false premise, you can construct any, any fantasy on it. There was never a chokehold of the APMC. The bulk of farm produce is sold at the gate of the farmer, at the farm gate, because most farmers 
their crop is pledged in advance to private trade. They're most farmers and every Indian knows this, every, but a lot of those Indians don't pause to think out the contradiction between the fact that the chokehold is that of private trade, that of the sahukar, that of the corporation, and whose agents very often are the collectors at the door. And the idea of the chokehold of the APS. So th this is the falsehood involved in the uh, in this idea of choice of the APMC. The third is, see the middle classes and most of the editors pontificating on this, the 1991 moment, well, actually, Mr. Gupta, former editor-in-chief of the Indian Express and running the print has repeatedly said, Never waste a good crisis. He's paraphrasing, though I'm not sure he's aware of it. Winston Churchill, hmm? hardly the greatest Democrat in the world, yeah, who believed in the use of chemical weapons against the primitive races like those in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, well, he, he gave people a choice didn't he, between being bombed with chemical and conventional weapons, and he chose chemical. Anyway, the thing is, Never waste a good crisis, which is what I told you in answer to the first question, that these guys are on their knees now. Let's let's kneecap them or break their bones because they can't. Now, all, all of them, all, the, all of this stuff that has been directed has been based on demonizing the APMC and the purported lack of choice of the farmer. But the farmer, have made a choice, farmer has made a choice. Given access to MSP, given access to MSP, they will choose MSP. Hmm. Now, another thing about that written guarantee, here's another problem about it. MSP covers some 23 crops, which together cumulatively mu must account for an overwhelming share of gross crop area in the country. Actually, MSP is paid out on two crops, as everyone knows. The farmers from Punjab who are sitting outside Delhi will tell you that they have never been able to access MSP on anything other than wheat and rice. So that is their choice. They can grow wheat or they can grow rice. Now, if you paid out the MSP on all the 23 crops and included a couple more, you would have real diversification. The consumer as well would have choice the farmer would have a far greater choice in what to grow, right? Whereas you are giving him or her no choice at present. This is all you will grow. So this is the whole game around the idea of choice. Absolutely. And in this context, I also wanted to ask you about an issue you've been highlighting for the past at least a few days. And this is regarding, of course, the provision in the Farmers Produce Trade and Commerce Act. Which says, which talks about the legal proceedings around it, and uh, it's a fairly. I mean, it's interesting. It's also scary in the sense that it gives a huge amount of immunity to all those concerned, the the the, the officers, of course. And it's so one of those omnibus laws, which it's very unclear what it exactly is doing in a law that is supposedly supposed to do with farming. So, could you also talk a bit about the implication to this for the democracy as a whole? Yeah, well, you know, the extra, see, see, Pranjal, many laws have a clause dealing with what are the legal protocols permissible and not. So that in itself is not novel. What is extraordinary is the extent to which this immunity goes. It, it protects you from prosecution for crime. You may not even have planned as well. It says, one, one clause says uh, uh, that no, no suit, no prosecution shall lie against the central government, against the state government, against any officer of the central government or of the state government or any other person who has done something with it. good faith, in intention and good faith. Right. Yeah. Now, who is this any other person? 
Is it the farmer? Obviously not, because it's barring the farmer from the jurisdiction of the civil court. Any other person easily translates to corporation or big business. Right. That's one set of things. Second, it bars the jurisdiction of the civil court. No court may pass any injunction, etc., on any matter under this. Third, it makes it clear that the low-level executive, subdivisional authority, you know, you're talking about collectors, deputy collectors, etc., now become a judiciary. That is spectacular. You are converting the lowest levels of the administration, low levels of the um, administration into judges, juries, and execution. So with these three things, it goes way over the top. The last time you had something terrible on that scale was during the emergency of 1975-77, when we suspended fundamental rights altogether, and the constitution itself meant very little. Right. So that those laws are extraordinary. They do not affect only farmers. They affect every citizen. It means that news click cannot go in a PIL against large scale wrongdoing of some company or corporation in Odisha or anywhere else. No PILs, no public interest litigation. No, look how terrible the clauses are that a body like the Bar Council of Delhi has protested vehemently and they have protested on several grounds. One, they've said this conversion of executive into transfer of judicial power, the words the Bar Council has used, dangerous and a blunder. It is dangerous and a blunder. The second thing the Bar Council has said is that, what are you doing to lawyers? You're dismantling the district level courts. One, you're dis you're, when you're dismantling the district level courts, what about for all the citizens around? who need those courts. Third uh, is that when you, what happens to lawyers who cannot take up such cases? Mm -hmm. Hmm? Now, if you are arguing that you can go much higher, you can put in, you know, in, to begin with, there is an incredible imbalance of power between private traders, corporations, and the farmer. Who is capable of taking legal recourse? So the laws on the the laws exclude legal recourse of the Indian citizen to an extraordinary degree. In a different way, they have done the same thing in the labor courts, but not with this language. There also, you make it impossible for a trade union to function. You make it impossible in the name of efficiencies to uh, for a trade union to to for a work for workers in a factory to go on strike. So essentially, in fact, the ordinances that came during the lockdown were official declaration proclamations of bonded labor by ordinance. Now you are codifying those in laws. So all of this together tells you how dangerous it is for every single Indian that this process of shutting out legal recourse goes. Article 32 of the Constitution of India guarantees the citizen the possibility of legal remedies, which means the legal action you can take. But when you have judges who are saying, we would like to discourage, you know, the kind of frivolous petitions that go on, that is the most basic and fundamental right of a citizen in a democracy. So it's essentially this exclusion is striking at the basic structure of the constitution of the right, right to legal remedy. Absolutely. And speaking of democracy, of course, uh, one final question on the media. And this is an issue you've been talking about for decades, of course. The amount of coverage, for instance, that is dedicated to agriculture. Earlier on News Clicks, a couple of months ago, also you talked about the pandemic and how the media was responding. But now we have a scenario where actually Farmers in such huge numbers, in hundreds of thousands, actually are at the borders of Delhi. It's not even that 
you have to assign an agriculture correspondent or a rural correspondent we see hundreds and thousands of people actually sitting on the borders and even now the media narrative has either been like you said the most well intentioned options might be talking about the stranglehold and we have the vicious elements talking about khalistan talking about this being a rich conspiracy and etc so how do you see the media scenario right now well actually there are some journalists visiting there because now it is not about farming but it is about it's a political issue it's an explosive political issue one but today the indian express has yet another editorial government is being reasonable it's up to the farmers now they have scored a moral victory now they should just shut up and get out of there and agree to whatever the government said the point is this whole understanding of what is compromise you have passed a law in which i have had no say no consultation and this nonsense of consulting and and the media are peddling this that consultations between daily think tanks or what i call stink tanks intellectually is equal to consultation the farmers have made a choice and they are at the gates of delhi giving the central government the choice right so why don't we now celebrate the doctrine of choice <laughs> over here why don't we celebrate that that doctrine of choice now at this moment the second the second part of it is that the consultation there is only one body but let me show you how much the farmers have asked for that consultation there is in your recent history of the last 15 years one body far more representative than a bunch of uh, than a bunch of stink tank intellectuals and a niti ayog chief who says india has too much of a is too much of a democracy to do anything meaningful by way of reforms unlike that there was an extraordinary body called the national commission for farmers do you know that if if every farmer in this country knows two words of english yeah or three it is swaminathan commission report from gurdaspur in punjab to guduvancheri in tamil nadu farmers have demanded that in the november 29 2018 at a rally at which you were present i was present nearly well somewhere between 1 and 2 lakh farmers gathered outside parliament making include making many demands including several of those that those farmers today at the at the haryana delhi border are making showing you that it's not they made a choice a reason choice when the country's most distinguished agro scientists together together with seven others including the heads of nabard one time had a very distinguished commission based on the widest possible consultation produced a report the farmers were all for it hmm. and you keep quiet about that after having promised to implement it in your 2014 manifesto so who is the one who is running away from consultation who is the one who is not being unreasonable you have just taken that off the table because it didn't it told you something you didn't like right. so that is what the media are look at these editorials show me one editorial which even mentions the swaminathan commission the second thing i am asking you i am asking fellow journalists i am begging your audiences to stop looking at these media as some sort of independent oracle system <laughs> the very corporations the farmers are apprehensive of and who are and who they are fighting the media are part of those very corporations hmm. you can hear you can hear the cries of against mr ambani in the rallies and the slogans of the farmers 
Mr. Ambani is the richest Indian in the world, the fifth richest man in the world, maybe fourth, and the biggest owner of media in India, the biggest group. Right. Now you have several other groups whose uh, owners, if they aren't already in agricultural and agriculture and food processing, they are in many ways, Benami, they will come out very soon. They need this. So the corporate, the editorial writers have made a choice between speaking the truth and voicing what their corporate bosses want. Do you know, I believe that today the Indian media, the dominant or corporate media, whether television anchor or editorial writer, is living up brilliantly to the, to the definition of editorial writers given by Murray Kempton, one time editor of the New Republic, one of the editors of the New Republic in the 60s looking at what was happening in Vietnam and elsewhere and how the media were covering it, Kempton said something that would so totally fit for you today. He said, the job of the editorial writer is to go down into the valley after the battle is over and shoot the wounded. Be my guest. Thank you so much, Sainath, for talking to us. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching News Click.